Okay, um, we're gonna get started. We know that some of you do need to leave by 1.30, so please feel free to just get up and leave. Um, this is being recorded, so it will be made available to you. Um, and if you have follow-up questions, you can always contact our office and let us know that you were present at the presentation and you have follow-up questions. So just get up and go if you have to, no big deal. But we're gonna try to move through it so you can see it all. All right, so uh, my name is Allie Tucker. I am one of the attorneys with Student Legal Services. We are um, an office with Ohio State where we have a contract with Ohio State to provide legal services to students. Yeah, and I'm Molly Phillips. I'm another attorney in the office. Um, our office is over in the South Campus Gateway. Um, so I understand that some of you are, or all of you, are seeking admission maybe to Ohio State as a uh, full-time student. And um, you know, in the event that happens, then you may be eligible for our services in the future. Um, you can find us online. We have a, a website. Um, it's osu.edu, and then it's SLS. Um, and otherwise, you know, you can give us a call and let us know if you need help concerning any legal issues while you're a student. Okay. So we're going to get started right away um, with our first topic. We're trying to cover a really wide range of areas here. So we're going to start with um, driving laws, insurance, purchasing a car, repairs, and accidents. And these are basically the top things that we think you should know about these areas. So um, to drive in Ohio, you do need to get an Ohio driver's license. An international driver's license is not considered enough by the state of Ohio, the police um, department and the prosecutor's office if you are a resident. So if you are a, considered a resident here, you must get an Ohio driver's license. So the question is, what's a resident? If you are a student here or seeking to become a student here, it is our understanding that they would consider you a resident. So international driver's licenses are not enough. We don't necessarily agree with it, but we're not the ones that enforce the laws. We just want you guys to be aware of this law, okay? So please apply for your temporary permit and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. This is, that's one of the biggest issues that we see for international students in our office. So there's a huge misperception in the international student community that it's okay to drive um, on your license from home. And that's very likely because someone told you along the way that it was gonna be okay once you got here. Um, what we're here to tell you is that the police officers here in Columbus don't see the law the same way. Um, and so regardless of whatever was told to you, you know, at home or by somebody else here, the reality is if you get pulled over and you show your license from home, even if you have an international driver's permit with you at the time, they will ticket you for something that's called no ops. It's a no operator's permit here in Ohio. And that's something that you have to go to court for. It's not something that you can just kind of pay a fine and be done with it. I Mm -hmm. I showed him the national license, he said no, not enough. But I saw my country license, he said okay, you can drive for four months since we've come to United States. Okay. And that's a perfect example of how much discretion is actually in the hands of the officers who are stopping the people who, you know, are getting pulled over. You know, an officer has a, a discretion whether to write you a ticket whenever you're pulled over. Um, and, you know, the, but the reality is because of the numbers of international students that we see coming into our offices, we know that there are a lot of Columbus police officers that have a different opinion of the law. Um, and. You know, we've also had sought clarification of this from the Columbus, Columbus Prosecutor's Office and the Ohio BMV, um, and they've both confirmed Allie, what Allie just explained to you, which is once you're a student, you are no longer a bona fide tourist in this company or in this country, um, and so at that time, you are not legally driving if you if you don't have an Ohio driver's license. So you know, we just want to make sure that you're protected. You know, ultimately, if you have to go to a court over something like this, it's not going to be the end of the world. It's going to be a lot of hassle, and you're going to have to pay some money so you know why not avoid it on the front end if you're just able to go and get your driver's license if you have a driver's license in your home country it's not gonna be a problem it's just a little bit of a hassle to get one here okay and one last point on that before we move on is that in that situation it's great that he used that discretion part of the problem is that when we see people you've already been charged and we can't undo that so we can defend you but that defense has never worked before so we just want to avoid the charge in the first place Okay, so let's move on to temporary permits. So this is the first license that you will receive um, when you seek to drive in Ohio. We want everyone to be aware because we see a lot of this. If you are driving with a temporary permit, at, at no time can you drive by yourself, period. 
even if it's an emergency, right? You always have to have another person in the front passenger seat who has an Ohio driver's license, so Ohio, not another state within the United States and not another international driver's license, who's over 21 years of age and is not under the influence of alcohol or drugs. We see a lot of this. People say, you know, I know that I have to have somebody, but I had to run to class or I had this appointment. We understand, but this is the law, and they will ticket you for this, okay? Um, we covered all that, Molly, do you have any? No, I don't think with the temps. You can talk about car Okay, so car insurance. Car insurance is probably one of the biggest problems that we see with international students, just misunderstandings about it. And first of all, I just want to encourage you to know that, you know, this is not something that's intuitive. Um, you should never feel silly asking questions about it because, you know, not no, nobody really gets this stuff when they're young adults. You know, it's not just international students that are confused by the laws and what the requirements are here. The tricky thing is for most of you is that you're kind of navigating on your own. You know, a lot of people that live here and grew up here have parents to show them what to do. Um, and so, you know, it, in Ohio, you have to have insurance in order to drive, okay? There, there are no exceptions to that rule whatsoever, which means you, know, you have to have it when you have a permit. Um, so there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. Lots of students don't get uh, car insurance when they have just a temporary license. Um, you have to have it when you do finally get your license, okay? Um, here in Ohio, we have what are called minimum coverage requirements, okay? And so if after, yep. Sure. Yeah, so if you don't have insurance and you're pulled over or you cause an accident or things like that, there can be lots of ramifications, but legally um, that can be a separate charge, okay? So in addition to maybe not having a license or um, something like that, then you can get another citation for um, not have proving financial responsibility, okay? So compliance with the financial responsibility laws. Not to mention the economic impact that well, you might face, which we'll talk about here in a minute, okay? Um, so there, there are both legal ramifications and financial ramifications if you are driving without insurance, potentially, okay? Um, and your license can actually be suspended if you do cause an accident and you're driving without, um, without insurance at the time. And lastly, just to add to that, Molly, I'm sorry. Um, oh, please. If you have a ticket, so let's say you get a speeding ticket and you have a totally valid Ohio license, and there's a little box on the ticket that says proof of financial responsibility shown. If it's not checked at all or if no is checked, once you pay that ticket, that ticket automatically goes to the Bureau of Murder Vehicles in Ohio. If it's checked no or there is no check mark whatsoever, your license is going to be suspended. They say they'll send you a letter asking you to show proof of insurance, but we know that the mail isn't reliable, addresses change, not everybody updates the BMV. So you're gonna get a license suspension, so let's say you don't know your license is suspended, so you keep driving, now you're gonna get pulled over and cited with driving under suspension, which is a much more serious offense. Yes. When I was in college, I didn't have insurance. Great. <laughs> Yeah, so they can, yeah, if they run your tags, you know, there is, you know, they can get you for not being registered. They can also get you for not showing, um, you know, your insurance. But we don't see a lot of that through um, the Columbus Parking Bureau, but that's not to say that it couldn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely something to think about um, because, you know, you want to have your insurance with you at all times. So when you're driving, usually you get a little card that you can stick right into your wallet. Um, and then you should also have um, something in the car itself. Um, you know, I know a lot of people on campus use Car2Go. So has anyone used Car2Go? Anyone? Yeah? No? Okay. So car to go um, would be kind of the exception um, because you are fully insured under car to go if you do use that program. So it might be a good option for someone in the event, you know, you're, you're kind of overwhelmed by this whole process of car buying and um, buying insurance as, you know, an option for someone because you will be covered. Um, when it's, what does insurance cover? That depends, okay? So this is very, it, it's very case specific. Insurance policies are going to cover a whole variety of things. Um, if you get online and you go online to purchase an insurance policy and you ask for just state minimum coverage, okay? That will protect you under the law. What I mean by that is that you won't get a citation for not having car insurance if you get minimum coverage, but and this is a big but, it's not really gonna protect you in the event a couple of things occur. So if you are driving and you are the person that causes an accident, okay, minimum coverage will cover the other person's vehicle, but it will not cover your own, okay? 
So you need to have comprehensive collision car insurance if you want your own car to be covered in the event you cause the accident. Okay, the other situation that you won't be covered if you just get state minimum coverage is a situation in which you hit someone or they hit you and it's their fault, but they don't have car insurance. Because typically their car insurance will cover the damages to your vehicle, okay? In that situation, you need to have uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage, okay? So it's our strong, strong, strong recommendation that if you are able to afford it, that you do try and get comprehensive car insurance because it will protect you in all of those situations. Whether you're the person who is causing the accident, whether you're the person who is not responsible for responsible for the accident or even if you get into an accident with somebody who doesn't have car insurance, okay? I see so many students that get into devastating financial situations over car accidents that are completely avoidable, you know? And some students are driving really nice cars, so I, I know it's not an affordability issue. You know, sometimes it can be, but if you shop around, chances are you might be able to find something that would actually be beneficial to you in the long run and it might be something that you should really consider, you know, to try and get that comprehensive coverage. Um, Molly, can I jump in? Yes. I got two more points about accidents, and it's not on the screen, but I think that's important. If you are in an accident, so it can involve another car or an accident, it is considered an accident if you damage property. So if you run into a stop sign, you have to report it, okay? If you do not stop and exchange information with the other driver or file a police report if it's a property damage case, you can be charged with a crime called a hit skip. It's the same thing as a hit and run, okay? It doesn't sound like it makes sense, especially for the property, but you have to exchange information and honestly, we recommend always filing a police report. I don't know if we have that screen in this presentation, yeah. but the other thing is, when Molly was talking about financial considerations, if you get in an accident with somebody and it's your fault and you do not have insurance, the other person's insurance company is going to put a suspension on your driver's license for the entire amount of damage. That could be thousands of dollars. I've seen them over $20,000 worth of damages that students have been facing. Students at Ohio State you know, just people like you, you know, have faced because they made the choice not to drive to, or to drive without insurance. And, you know, in order to save a couple hundred bucks, you know, they decided to take this path. And now they're not going to be able to drive again until that debt is paid off. So, you know, it really is something to think about. Car accidents happen. They happen to everyone, you know. Um, nobody is immune. And so you really want to think about car insurance because I just think it is a necessary expense if you are going to be driving and it is required. Okay. Um, yeah. So if you plan to drive and you don't drive a car, this is another misperception by people. Um, if, if you don't own a car, let's say you're just planning to drive your friend's car, you can't just rely on the fact that you're going to be covered by that car, that person's insurance, okay? You might be, maybe, um, but like I said, there are a lot of differences with car insurance policies, and some policies only track the one driver who is named on the policy itself, okay? So um, the best way to protect yourself is to make sure that you have your own policy of coverage, even if you choose not to buy a car yourself. Um, <clears throat> no, 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 that's fine. Okay, so we've touched upon traffic charges a little bit, and sorry for the screen, it keeps jumping. I'm trying to prevent it from happening. Um, I don't know if it's that or this. I don't know. So a couple of different charges that we want to touch upon, and we have touched, talked about these a little bit. Um, driving outside the temporary permit restrictions is a big one. So, you know, every, it, bad luck just happens. And even though you're only driving a mile, um, maybe you dropped off your, the other driver, it can still happen, okay? They can run the plate if it's registered to you. They can see that you only have a temporary license. So police officers will frequently get behind vehicles and just run the plate. They can absolutely do that. They'll say, oh, they only have a temporary license. I don't see anybody in the car then pulling them over. And that's within the realm of the law. Okay, um, no operator's license is the same thing. It's another way of saying you don't have a valid license. Um, or if you have just an international driver's license, that's the charge that you would receive if they feel like you are considered a resident and not a tourist. Um, and then there's also the low level offenses that we see a lot, speeding tickets, marked lanes violations, failure to yield, traffic control devices. Um, those are all minor offenses, but you can be pulled over for something minor and something greater can come out of it. So if you get pulled over for a speeding ticket and now they realize that you don't have a full license, maybe you're driving under the influence, 
did, or maybe you have something else in the car that's illegal. So these, these small things happen, um, but we just want you guys to be aware of it. Okay, um, so car accidents. Um, a couple of things. When you do get involved in an accident, um, the first thing to note is that you want to make sure that you're in a safe location. Um, so in the event you guys are, are in a place where both vehicles can be you know, taken off to the side of the road and everybody's able to do that, then that is what you are supposed to do. Um, if not, then leave the car where you are. So if the cars are totaled, if there is too much damage to the vehicle, um, if you think anyone was injured, then just leave them where they are. Um, and then we immediately say that you should call the police always, okay? Um, there are lots of people who, if you get into an accident with them, um, they are going to say, oh, let's just handle this amongst ourselves. You know, like, I, just, let's just exchange information. No need to call the police. Please don't do that. Um, there are some really bad people in this world, um, and there are people that are going to change their story. So, you know, while they're telling you, hey, it's my fault, I know I'm, I'm going to take responsibility. Don't worry about it. My insurance company is going to pay for it and everything. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, you get a phone call from their insurance company and they're saying, well, no, they said that you were responsible for the car accident. Um, you really need an objective outsider to come out to assess the scene, to interview any witnesses that are there, um, and to file a citation in the event somebody is responsible for the accident. Now, there are situations when it, the, the weather is really bad um, or, you know, let's say it's a really busy day when a police officer will tell you that they're not going to respond to the scene. So they might not actually come out, but I think it's always a good idea to try. Um, and, you know, even if you are concerned that you are the person that's responsible, I know that sounds counterintuitive, um, but it is good for the police to come out and ob objectively review what happened because then, you know, you can potentially have a third party witness in the event that person tries to claim that they had these crazy injuries or something like that, which really didn't occur, okay? Um, what do you say if the police come? Um, so, you know, you should always be respectful and polite. And we're going to talk a little bit more about dealing with police here in just a little while. Allie's going to do almost a whole section of our presentation on that. Um, and you want to answer any questions that they have. Um, remember, you're not the one who is going to make a decision about who was responsible for this situation. Um, what, the, what the police need from you is they need facts, OK? So they need to know what happened, all right? And if you don't tell them those facts, then they aren't going to have them. Um, and so especially you know, if you are the person that you don't think you were responsible for what happened, you need to tell them what happened. Um, so lots of times, you know, and this is not just international students, just people in general are very fearful about interacting with the police. Um, but the reality is this is your chance. <laughs> and if you don't tell them your side of the story, um, then it's possible that the other person will tell them something that would cause them to fault you for the accident. And once that police officer says that it's your fault, it's a really tough road to reverse. Looks like I had a hand, no? Okay. So. Um, what if somebody is injured? Um, you know, if somebody is injured, obviously you should call an ambulance if it's something that is severe enough um, to require something like that. Um, otherwise, you know, if it's something just really minor or the person thinks that they're okay, um, then I mean, you're going to have to determine that on a case by case basis and decide whether or not you can wait and just go and see an urgent care. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so when do you report it to the insurance company? Um, this, you know, I, I think if you have a good relationship with your insurer, you should be you should be calling your insurance company right away. Um, you know, if if a police officer does not respond to the scene, it, some of the larger insurance companies will actually send an adjuster right out to the scene to uh, take really good pictures and objectively assess what happened right there. Um, but yeah, you need to let them know what happened because your insurance company is going to be your advocate. Um, you know, in the event there is a dispute concerning liability, you know, they don't want to pay that money out if they don't have to. Um, and so, you know, they're going to be on your side in that situation. You see these cheesy commercials with Nationwide on your side. Um, yeah, I mean, but it, in reality, you know, you guys are on the same team, you know, for the most part. So you, you want to make sure that they're apprised of the situation and they know what's going on because if you put them in a position to be a better advocate for you, the chances are the claim will get resolved favorably. Did I see a hand? No. Okay. Um, so if you're required to appear in court or give a statement, make any payments, et cetera, et cetera, please see, seek legal advice first. 
Um, you know, we just had a situation recently, was it an international student? Where um, the person was trying to, it was an international student, person was trying to work out a car accident case with another person without having to go through insurance. Um, and it was clear that the guy, the other guy on the other side was just gouging our student, you know, just, you know, making up damages, you know, the, no substantiation for any of the damages that, for, for the claim. And he was just taking advantage of our student because our student was fearful because he didn't have insurance. Um, you know, make sure you see an attorney, you know, if you're not eligible for our services, you know, try and consult with someone else or a trusted advisor um, because, you know, you don't want to get yourself into a really sticky situation and we've seen them a lot. Okay. Let's, I'm just going to touch yeah. base on that one example Molly gave. So in that situation, the other driver was asking for $6,400 for the damages for a, basically a fender bender. It was just a, you ran into the back of him in very slow moving traffic. So when the student came to us, he had already been communicating with this other person. Um, I saw the text messages. I definitely felt like he was taking advantage, I got involved, and as soon as I got involved, the other driver was completely defensive, wouldn't talk to me, um, told me that he would send me documentation, which I emailed a specific request for, and I still haven't heard from him. So he was clearly taking advantage of our client, and so my response to the client was, we're done dealing with him, and we'll deal with his insurance. And yes, you're probably going to get a suspension on your license because you were driving without insurance, but you know what, $6,400 is a lot of money. So he was claiming injuries and he got out of the car and walked away and was perfectly fine. He was claiming lost wages. I mean, these are things that people make up because they see an opportunity, okay? My client was driving a nice car and English wasn't his first language. And like Molly said, there are bad people in the world that take advantage of that situation. And that was 100% what was going on. So we stopped talking to him and now we're dealing with the insurance company, okay? Okay, so car buying and selling, I see a lot of uh, questions from international students and domestic students for that matter about um, buying and selling cars. Um, you know, obviously you have the biggest choice probably at the outset would be whether or not you want to buy a new car or used car. It's going to be a very different experience, you know, probably if you're buying a used car versus a new car. Um, you know, most students are buying used cars, but every once in a while we see students that are buying um, new cars. Um, you know, most new cars are going to be sold through a dealership, um, and, you know, there are lots of Ohio laws that protect you in the purchase of a new car. So if you buy a new car and there are a lot of problems with it, you, the Lemon laws will let you replace that vehicle and everything. It's a whole different experience when you're buying a used car, okay? You can buy a used car from a dealership. You can buy a used car from a private party. Um, you can buy a used car from some place out in, you know, New York and off of eBay and, you know, then you're flying out there to buy it. I mean, there are a million ways to buy a used vehicle, but you need to really think about it in deciding, you know, how you actually want to proceed with the transaction because there can be consequences depending upon the type of way that you choose to proceed. Um, you know, most of the problems that we see arise from the sale of used vehicles. You know, um, there is a lot of opportunity to deceive people in the sale of used vehicles. Um, and, you know, the laws just really aren't as strong in protecting people. Um, you know, unfortunately, what we see a lot of times are situations where um, students have signed a bill of sale or a contract and it says that the vehicle is being sold as is, okay? Um, if that language is contained anywhere on your purchase contract, um, that's really tough language to get around here in Ohio. It basically says there are no warranties on the vehicle. So once you drive it off the lot, it's your responsibility. And it really is. It's your responsibility. So even if the next day, you know, the car breaks down, um, that can be a big problem for you, okay? So you wanna make sure you do a lot of research before you buy a car. Don't just rely upon what the person is telling you about the vehicle. You wanna make sure that you pull a vehicle report. So I'm sure you guys have heard of Carfax reports. Um, there are a couple of private companies that will actually run a report so that if any time any car was in an accident or anything like that, that should be something that would be available. I will tell you though that they're not perfect, okay? Um, just because there isn't a problem on a Carfax doesn't mean that the car is 100% you know, in great shape. Um, I think it's really important whenever we buy a, new, a used vehicle, we always take it to a mechanic and let them inspect it. So unless you are somebody who knows a lot about cars and you're able to handle inspection by yourself, not me, 
um, then, you know, I take it to someone, yeah, you have to pay them some money to do it, but I think that that's money well spent before you spend then $6,000 on a vehicle. Um, so with warranties, you know, I touched on this just briefly, but if, 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 you're, if you don't have any express warranties in the purchase of the vehicle um, with a used car, it's very unlikely that you're going to be covered in the event something goes wrong with your car, even if it was shortly after purchase. So I have a lot of students in my office that say, I, I mean, I've only had this car for a week and the transmission is blown and I'm having all these problems. And I'm like, well, <laughs> let's take a look at your purchase documents. And there just really isn't a lot to help you with. Um, so, you know, if, if it's really important to you to have that financial security, you know, to know that you're not going to have this huge investment in repairs, then you want to make sure that you're demanding some sort of a warranty in the purchase of the vehicle. Title and registration. So um, you have to register your car um, here in the state of Ohio. That, that's how you get your license plate, right? Um, and that the biggest... And most people know that, but you know the biggest thing is then that that registration does have to be updated. Okay, so um, you can buy a registration for a year or two years. Two years, right, is the maximum. Yes. Um, in the state of Ohio, you don't get a break if you pay for two years, but you can do it. So if you're somebody who's forgetful, you can just do it every two years. The biggest thing that we see students run into because students are you know so transitory, you guys move so much. Um, like Ali said, people forget to update their information with the BMV. And so what happens is, you know, every year you're supposed to be renewing your registration and they send out a notice to you in the mail. But if you've moved, then you might not get it. Um, and then people just forget, you know. Um, and then all of a sudden you're getting pulled over because you haven't updated your registration. And that is something that a police officer can pull you over for. Okay? And another point on that, this is just a recent issue we're dealing with in our office on a case, is if you purchase a car from somebody else, you have to change over the title. Okay, so whoever owns the vehicle at any given time is the titled owner of that car. So there's a title document with their name, the BMV has their name. So if you purchase a car from someone else, there has to be a process by which that title gets signed over to you. And it's not that complicated, but we see a lot of students who don't go through that small process or they lose the title. And technically, if you get pulled over, it can look to a police officer like you're driving a stolen vehicle. They don't know that that's your friend, your cousin, your sister, whoever. So you really need to go through that process. Also, if you have a car and you sell it and then you get a new car, you can't just take the plates from the old car and put them on the new car. Okay, that is another offense for which you can be pulled over and charged. It's called, a use, called using plates to another vehicle. There has to be a whole new set of plates and registration issued for the new vehicle. Okay, so there's a whole process for that as well. Um, and the BMV has a pretty decent website with information about all of that. Yeah, and if you ever have questions, then go to the BMV too um, and try and talk to them about it. It's a pain, but you know, lots of times it can be hard to get people on the phone with the BMV. Um, yeah, and with the titles, um, if, if you are ever a student um, and you're transferring title to someone else, um, before you write on the back of the title, so you can sign, you can actually assign title on the back of it, um, first of all, make sure you're in front of a notary, but second of all, if you're eligible for our services, just come in because we can help you. Like, they're super finicky about the way, the writing uh, on the back of a title. If there are any X's or anything like that that's going to void the title and then you're going to have to get a new one, it's a huge pain. Um, so come into our office and we can help you with drafting the assignment of title um, and kind of walk you through the process. Taxes and value of the car. So when you do uh, transfer title either in front of a title agent or on the back of the title itself, you have to state what the purchase price was for the vehicle. So we have a lot of international students that sell cars from friends to friends. I mean, I just think, you know, they're done with school, they go back home and they sell their car to their buddy. Um, I think there's another misperception that um, you know it's okay to state that the purchase price of the vehicle was zero dollars on the back of the title, so that you don't have to pay sales tax. Because if you say that the you know the purchase price was seven thousand dollars, then you do have to pay sales tax to the state of Ohio. Um, so people are trying to avoid having to do that. Let me tell you why that's a bad idea. Okay, if you let's say you're driving a 2013 Honda Accord. Okay, and you bought it from your friend for $12,000, but you write on the back of that um, title that you purchased it for $0. Once that goes through the state of Ohio, it is automatically flagged as being a disproportionate value for that car. That car is worth a lot more money than it was sold for. And so what happens is, 
you get a letter from the state of Ohio and they say, here's the deal, either pay this much money in your sales tax or sign this affidavit that says that you really did not pay anything for the vehicle. So if you really did get it as a, as a gift, it's fine, you just sign the affidavit, that's a sworn statement, that's not a big deal. But if you didn't, then you're in a really tricky spot because either you're gonna falsify a state document, which is a big no-no, or you're gonna have to just pay the sales tax anyways. So, you know, it's really our strong advice to just avoid that situation in the first place. I get a lot of panicky, panicky, panicky students in our office about that situation. And our advice is always just pay the tax. You know, don't, avoid the issue. Um, because you don't wanna dig yourself into a deeper hole. Okay, um, but if you have questions about sales tax and things like that, you can always come in and see us or um, you, know, you can call the Ohio Department of Taxation and they actually will help you out because they want your money. Okay, so that's the end of our presentation on cars, insurance, purchasing, all that stuff. So do you guys have any questions about those issues because we're gonna move on to our consumer, um, to our consumer section. Any specific questions? Yep. Yes. Yeah, no, so here in Ohio you actually have to have a front plate on your vehicle. Full disclosure for full disclosure, I do not have a front plate on my vehicle. It, it's so true. I don't. I just haven't put it on there. But but it isn't. And you know what the biggest problem is? That is one thing that they will, the city of Columbus will um, ticket you for. So just a just a parking ticket. Yeah. You'll get a parking ticket if you don't have a front license plate on your vehicle. And I have a lot of students who come <laughs> in with that citation, and Molly's going to get one. So. <laughs> I know. I, I probably am. I used you in an intake yesterday. I said she's going to have one. But you, you <laughs> Car a lot of cars don't come with a amount, especially if you buy in a different state. That's not a defense. You have to go either drill it yourself or take it to a body shop yeah. and have them drill an amount. Yeah, and so I bought a new car, and lots of times, even you know, I bought a new car in Ohio, but they still didn't have the bolts like screwed in there, and it's still I just haven't put them on yet. Um, and just and so, on the dash, if you have it, is it's not going to fly forever. Yeah. You know, eventually they're going to be like, this is ridiculous. So you should do it. You should do it just because you can get a parking ticket, especially if you're doing city parking, because that is something that we get all the time. It's like 35 bucks if you don't put the license plate on there. Um, so, and they take a picture of it. I mean, there's no defense to that, you know? Um, so I just put it on there. Yep. When I buy a new car, there's a limit, limit size of like 30 days. Yep. Can I go to another state and just type it? Yes, you can go on another, yes, absolutely. That is a legal registration for that 30 day period. So it's fine to drive that vehicle in another state. Um, that's a really good question. But yeah, it's totally fine to drive that out of the state of Ohio. Um, you just make, gotta make sure that you, once you get to that 30 day point that you do get a valid registration. Yep. I was wondering, so I got a temporary license plate for a while. So is there kind of a way to get rid of that? It's to do the temporary license plate. Yeah. Um, so, did you did you then go and get a regular license plate yeah, and a registration? Yeah. So, no, you can just throw that away. Yep. They, those numbers are like specific, um, and so you know, there's nothing you need to do with that in particular. Yeah, so I, it's my understanding that most people here, and correct me if I'm wrong, are not full-time enrolled students at Ohio State yet. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay, okay, so not right now. Um, however, if you, do an autom if you do enroll as a student here, um, then we would hope that you would enroll in our services. It's a $40 fee for the entire year for our services. Um, it's automatically assessed on your fee statement. Um, and you know, we would suggest not waiving that coverage um, because then you can come and see us as many times as you want. Okay. Any other questions about? Sure, go ahead. By the way, I got the tickets parking in my car. I found it in my car. And uh, it was wrong with uh, wrong uh, number plate. What should I do? So it was a ticket on your car, but it was for a different car? Uh, no, for my car. But uh, there is some mistake in the number of the plate. Oh, the the person the the meter made like. Wrong thing. But was it you? Was did you commit the violation? 
was it obvious to you that you had the parking ticket was meant to be for you? If you tried to, yeah, you should just pay it because the reality, is, like those kind of what they call, you know, kind of mysterious violations or um, mistakes um, are things that don't actually constitute defense. Where do you park? Is it city parking? Uh, near the downtown. It's probably the city of Columbus, so it's the Columbus Parking Violations Bureau, and their website is columbuspvb.com. And they're actually reasonably helpful when you call them on the phone. Yeah, so if the car is titled to your name, then they would have your contact information, um, and you should be able to give them that in order to pull up the ticket. Because if you have unpaid parking tickets, um, you get late fees. You get late fees, and then eventually, if they find your car, they can tow it and immobilize it for non-payment. Yeah. And it can affect your ability to renew your registration. Right? What does it say? Columbus <laughs> Parking Violations Bureau. PVB, yeah, I think. ColumbusPVB.com. Any other questions about cars driving? Okay. So we're going to move into this, which is basically all my life, but I'll try to jump in and give you a break. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so our office handles a lot of uh, off-campus issues concerning with housing. So do most of you live in the, in like the campus area or no, far off campus? campus? No, no, off campus, further off campus. Okay, do most people rent their, their places where they're living right now? Okay, yeah, most people live. Okay, great. Um, so good, this, this information will still all be very pertinent to you. Um, you know, first of all, with your lease, um, one of the things that we really like to impress upon students is the concept of joint and several liability. Um, what that means is if you sign a lease with any other roommates, um, that all of you guys are going to be res responsible for the whole amount of a rent. So even if you come up with an agreement that, you know, let's say your rent is $2,000 and there are five of you living there and everybody's going to pay $400 per month, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, but if you, if you sign a joint and several liability lease, um, if one of those people just leaves, your landlord still gets to get that full amount of the rent. It doesn't matter that that one person has left. Um, so you really want to make sure that you sign what's called a roommate contract with your roommates, especially if it's not like your wife or your husband. Um, you know, if, if you are just living with roommates, you want to have an agreement between the parties stating what your agreements are with respect to any major payment issues and, you know, that you plan to split utilities and, you know, whether or not the utilities are going to be in each person's name. It's a good idea to have that in writing so that if somebody does screw you over, um, then you can actually go out after that person because you have something in writing. Um, subleasing, so in the event you decide to leave for a short period of time during your lease or for the remainder of your lease or you want to get out of your lease, um, you may decide to do what's called a sublease. Has anyone had to do that since they've been here? No? Okay. Um, so if you do decide, okay, yeah, you did? Did it go okay? Okay, good, great. Yes. Okay, great. Good. Great. So that can be a fantastic situation, you know, and like I said, we only see things when they go really badly. Like we don't see things when they go well, right? Um, so we have this very skewed perception of reality probably in our office. Um, but, you know, sometimes subleases go wrong, right? Um, and what a sublease is, is a situation where somebody's going to come in, pay your portion of the rent, live in your place for a while um, so that you don't have to pay it. A couple things to know. You are still liable for the rent if that person doesn't pay it. Okay, so you want to get some assurances from that person how they're going to actually pay the money. Um, if, if it's just a short term sublease, you might want to try getting all of the money up front. Like if it's like a two month sublease or something like that, you might want to try and get all that money up front to protect yourself. Um, if it's something that's more long term and they're not able to do that, then I would want to get some income verification, you know, or know how it is that they plan to pay for what it is that they're paying for. Um, with security deposits, um, you know, security deposits, what we want you to know first and foremost is that that is your money, not your landlord's money. Um, they take it from you at the beginning of the lease term in order to cover any damages or unpaid rent or anything like that um, during the lease term, okay? But at the end of the lease term, they have to return it to you, okay? Unless they are able to prove that you cause damage beyond normal wear and tear to the property or there's unpaid rent or other fees, okay? 
So what you need to know is that under Ohio law, that itemization or that reconciliation of your security deposit has to happen within 30 days of you terminating your lease agreement and giving them written notice of a forwarding address. So that's really important. When you move out, make sure you give your landlord written notice of a forwarding address so they can give you your security deposit back. If they haven't given it back to you, um, you know, and you are an enrolled student at Ohio State, make sure you come and see us because that's something that we can help you with. Um, but you should know that you are entitled to pursue them for double the amounts that they wrongfully withhold. Okay? Um, yes. Okay. Oh, just for the gas. Yes. Okay. It might be. I'd have to take a look at your particular lease. Some companies actually call it a gas budget or a gas deposit, but really what you're playing is just like a, an, a prorated rate for gas for the entire year. It might be like 25 or 30 bucks. 45 every month. 45. Security deposit only. Okay, security deposit only. And I pay the gas. And you pay the gas? Yeah, so I was one So are months. you paying the security deposit to the landlord or to the gas company? Yes. And I pay the security deposit. Okay, so that might be, so also, when you set up a utility for the first time, if you don't have a credit history, um, then sometimes they do require you to pay a security deposit up front, but usually that doesn't last for so long. How long have you been? I would definitely contact, is it Columbia Gas? Yeah. I would contact them and see what's going on with that because that, that's really, that's a weird set of facts to me. Yeah, I mean, usually, you know, you might have to pay you know, a couple hundred dollars up front because they don't have a credit history for you and they want to make sure that you're going to pay your bills. But once you've paid that, usually you're okay. And then usually after a year, they have to apply your security deposit to an outstanding bill. So that's an odd set of facts. I'm sorry, I can't be more helpful. Thank you. I'm going to ask you if I have a contract for a renter contract uh, for one year. Mm -hmm. Can I leave before that? So you can't leave before it unless one, you get the agreement of your landlord or you do some sort of a sublease situation or something like that. Otherwise, you remain liable under the underlying agreement, okay? So the only real way that your landlord is gonna let you out of that situation, there are a couple situations. One, if you live in a place that is super, in very high demand and they think that they're gonna be able to get more money out of the next renter, then they might let you out, all right? Um, otherwise, you know, it's very likely that you're gonna to have to give them something in return for their agreement to let you out. And usually that's security deposit, a free month's rent, et cetera. I don't have any problem of that. If they take the security deposit and let me leave. But sometimes they say you can't leave, you should they, uh, all, all the oh yeah, they'll definitely say that to you. Yeah. yeah, so under the law, if you just left, let's say theoretically you just yeah. said, I'm just leaving, you know? Yeah. So, the only thing that they can do in that situation is to take your security deposit and then they could sue you, okay? Or they could put it on your, on your credit report um, as an unpaid debt, okay? Um, so whether or not they're gonna do that, I, I, you know, they might not sue you. If it's a small landlord, if it's somebody who doesn't want to litigate an issue, there's always a possibility that they might not move forward. Also, under the law in Ohio, landlords have an obligation to what they call mitigate their damages. That means that they have to try and re-rent that property. They can't double charge someone. So once somebody gets into that apartment, then they can't charge you for that rent. So let's say there's six months left on your lease and you're like, I know that this place is gonna re-rent right away. Like it's in a good location. There are no vacant apartments in my place. Um, you know, it's a, good, it's a good price point. Then I oftentimes tell students, it's probably worth the risk to move out. You know, if your landlord's not working with you, you might want to consider just moving out and seeing what happens. Um, now, it is a risk. It's a huge risk. Um, because ultimately, if they're able to prove that they were unable to rent the property um, and that, you know, you, were, you didn't have grounds to terminate your lease, then they can hold you responsible for the remaining rent. How about if the same situation happened to on-campus housing? Um, so on-campus housing is a different situation. We actually can't advise students about on-campus contracts, and so I, I'm not familiar with the, with the paperwork, but my guess is that it would be the same, honestly. Um, you know, when you do sign on as a student um, renter, yeah, it's a lease. I mean, it's the same thing. You know, you're signing a lease with the university, um, so that would be my guess, although, you know, I really don't have a lot of experience with it because we're not allowed to get involved in those disputes. Well, I think we, let's move to repairs because we're running tight on okay. Okay guys, we're gonna talk about um, getting repairs. Um, so 
There is a, there's something called the landlord tenant statute. It's a law that protects you in addition to your lease agreement. Okay. So regardless of what your lease says, there is a separate law on the books here in Ohio that protects you as a tenant. Okay. Because leases are very one-sided. Your landlords draft them. They are made for the landlords, not for you. Okay, um, so but your landlord has an obligation to fix anything that is affecting the safety and habitability of your home, and he only has 30 days to do it. Okay, but this is really, really important if you take one thing away about housing. If there is a maintenance issue, you have to put it in writing to your landlord. Okay, so most landlords have phone numbers to call. That is intentional. They want to avoid you putting in something in writing to them because once you put something in writing to them, that is what starts the 30 day window. Okay, so get an email where you can send an email or get a cell phone where you can send a text message. And if they won't give you either of those, then drop off a post it note. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but you need to communicate the problem in writing to your landlord. Then they have 30 days to fix the problem. Not 30 days to start fixing the problem, 30 days to fix the problem. Okay? And if that doesn't happen, then you have a termination right. So you can terminate your lease if it's something that affects safety and habitability. Or, you know, you might be able to do a rent escrow action, which is something we won't get into today. Yep. Okay, so scams. We're going to move on to scams. Um, you know, some of the biggest scams that we see here on campus are sublease scams. So you had talked about, um, you know, you had a great situation with a sublease scam, uh, with a sublease, but some people are scammers when they um, will reach out to you when they know that you're subleasing a place, and they'll say, "Hey, you know, I'm moving from England, and I'm going to be there this summer." And then what they'll do is they'll send you a check for the entire amount of the rent plus like two thousand dollars. And you, because you're such a really good person, you'll say, hey, you know, you sent me too much rent. You weren't supposed to send me that much money. And they'll say, oh, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and deposit it and send me the difference. That's a fake check. So you go and you take it to the bank. They don't look fake. And the bank doesn't catch it. Catch it. You put it in your bank account and you write them a check for $2,000. They take it out of your bank account. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, the check bounces. And you've not only lost, you know, you've lost that money that you thought you were going to get from the subleaser, but then you've also lost the $2,000 that you wrote a check for. They're not going to give that back. Bank isn't going to give that back. Um, employment scams. scams um, the, the other biggest one we see here on campus are employment scams. It's a very similar set of facts. Usually you receive the solicitation in email. So somebody will say, hey, do you want to work from home? Make $400 a week doing administrative tasks. Sounds great, right? Um, same thing, they'll send you a check. They'll say, here's the deal, you need to make all these orders and then you need to deposit this check and you need to send this money here. And keep your $300 out of this. But same thing, fake, fake check, the check bounces, you lose a lot of money. Um, very little we're able to do in those situations. Oftentimes these people are overseas. Uh, it's a really tough situation, so just have your radar up if you see any of it. Um, door to door and on the street scams. Um, just know here, you know, if you're walking on the street and somebody comes up to you and they start talking to you, it's perf perfectly culturally acceptable to just walk away from them. Okay, so I've seen lots of international students that are like, they don't really know how to handle it, you know, the interaction. I mean, just walk away from these people. Um, and, you know, it, with door to door people, you know, there are lots of people that will come to your house and they'll, Say, hey, you know, we donate some money to this worthy cause and all that. A lot of those are scams. You know, so you want to make sure that before you give somebody money at your door, before you sign up for a service, that you do some research on those people. Go ahead. Okay, so some other issues that we see with students. Um, don't pay cash for expensive items. We do suggest some sort of a record of the transaction, and it's really tricky when you do pay in cash. If you have to do so, if the other person's requiring you to, then make sure you get a signed receipt from that person. So there's something evidencing the transaction. Okay, if we have nothing, then it's really tough. Um, again, receipts for expensive items, that kind of piggybacks on the first item. Make sure you're checking your bank statements for fraudulent transactions. I have a lot of international students that have kind of like several different bank accounts. And maybe there would be one that parents are monitoring or whatever. Um, just make sure you're always monitoring that stuff to make sure that um, there aren't any fraudulent charges on there. The other thing that I run into with international students a lot are mistaken identity situations with names. So, you know, make sure you're, you're, banking, you're paying attention to your bank statements to make sure that you're not having any problems with that. Um, 
Don't give your debit credit card unless it's a secure. That's pretty intuitive. Um, but if you do have a social security number, <clears throat> don't carry the card with you. Okay, so that's not safe. Um, it's very easy to misplace your wallet somewhere or have it taken from you, um, and that's a really crucial piece of identifying information that's really hard to get otherwise, um, and so that's a lot of fodder for scammers. Yeah, this is probably... Um, working at all? So you're studying. Okay. That's probably, this is probably something that we're going to skip over this, because we're, we have something we want to get to. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that you're right. Yeah, yeah. So if you're here on an F1 status, you probably wouldn't be able to, unless you're you're able to work on campus for a certain amount of hours. Um, but that's just kind of a little exception, so not really that important. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna move on to um, the last portion, and I think we should be able to get all this done by 1:30. So we're gonna talk about personal and public safety and dealing with the police. And um, we brought a special guest in for this portion of the presentation. This is Officer Cassie Schaefer. She works with the Ohio State University Police. She's a detective and she's a great ally and supporter of our office. And so um, I brought Officer Schaefer here because I want you guys to hear it straight from an officer and understand that I mean, she doesn't look that intimidating. So, <laughs> you know, um, I think it was really important for you guys to be exposed to that. So we're trying to finish by 1.30, just so you know. No and most of these guys are actually not enrolled in OSU yet, but they're studying to pass their English scores so that they can be enrolled. Okay. So perspective. And there she is again. Okay, so I'm going to let Officer Schaefer <laughs> talk about interacting. <laughs> interactions with the police because we we hear that a lot of international students don't really know what to do what you have to do and what you don't have to do all right so again i'm officer Schaefer. i go by cassie so you don't have to give me any direct title it's okay to interrupt at any point just raise your hand and let me know when you have a question okay so some of the things we're going to quickly go over is interaction with the police because it's pretty important to know that there's a big difference between probably what you did and where you're from to what you do here okay so one of the things we want to make sure that you understand is when we stop to identify somebody or just speak with somebody, 99.9% .9 of the time it's because there's a lawful reason, probable cause, whatever you want to call it, to speak to them. So if I know that Allie was walking down the street and somebody shattered a window, and I walk up to her and I say, hey, we have video of you, whatever it might be, I need you to identify yourself, that's, you have to do so. When I talk to you, I need to identify you so that I know who I'm speaking with for a multitude of reasons. Safety being the utmost and first thing. Then if you're not somebody who's responsible for something, I can say, okay, this person isn't responsible. I can move you on my way and get to business and figure out what happened with somebody else. Also, when we're identifying you, there's documentation that we have to do as police officers. So when I speak with you, I have to document who I talk to. And without that, it can't end, okay? And what types of identification do you guys have at this point? Passports? Yeah. Do you guys have Ohio State IDs? Like your Ohio Buck ID? Yeah. yeah. Buck ID. So passports are are great because yeah, they have your picture and things in them, but I want you guys to stop carrying those with you all the time. Biggest thing is because once they're stolen, it's a very difficult process to get a new one. Now you have, once you're a student, you're gonna get an identification card, the Buck ID. That we can run through our system, find your name, see that you're a person that's affiliated with this university. The other thing I strongly encourage you to do, and I know it's 20 bucks, is to get a state ID card. Now that, once, if it gets stolen, it's 20 bucks to get a new one. Where when your passport gets stolen or you lose that, it's a whole different process. <laughs> and I think everybody's shaking their heads like, oh, it's terrible, it's horrible, yeah. right? So the last thing you want to do is deal with that. So minimizing what you carry is a very big deal around here. Passports being one of them, passports, checkbooks, anything like that. We want to minimize what we're carrying, okay? Everything else is easy to replace, that not so much. Plus, you can't drive on that passport. Once you're a student here, you identify that you're living here as a student, things like that, you can't use that. And we get that a lot. We try to work with you to get you to understand that and educate people, but know that that's not a good thing, okay? Pulling over. 
I've been pulled over, I think, in my life like eight or nine times. I'm one of the worst drivers in America. So I can tell you exactly what to do, okay? Biggest thing is we want to pull to the right. No matter when, no matter if you're being pulled over or if they're going to pass you if you see lights and you hear sirens. Okay, it's a law you have to get over and out of the way. Now, sometimes you can't go right. That's the most preferable way to go. But if you have to go left or you need to peel apart at a light or something like that, but just know that once those lights are behind you, that's a signal for you either to stop or to get out of my way because there's an emergency to something else. Okay? If it's for you, the officer is going to pull behind you, and at night, they're going to flash all kinds of lights in your mirror so you can't see what we're doing. And that's for our safety. Okay? Stay in your vehicle. <laughs> Stay in your vehicle. All right? Some countries, you have to get out and go to the officer. Here, you stay in the vehicle. And I promise you, if you come out of your vehicle, you're going to meet a very irate person on the other end of that because they're not sure what's going on. Okay? And it's just purely because we don't know what intentions are. That's all. So if you stay in the vehicle, don't move around a whole bunch. If you can get your license and have your insurance card in a good spot, that's great. And then just put your hands on the wheel and simply just relax and stay in that position until the officer engages you. They're either going to come up to the left side of the vehicle or they could come up to the passenger side of the vehicle, depending on traffic, depending on the stop, things like that. So just be cognizant of where they're at. I would not. I would deter you from darting around the vehicle and disappearing for a while, coming back up, going back down, eating a sandwich, maybe making lunch or something. <laughs> Doesn't look good. But if you just sit and relax, the interaction will last about 10 to 15 minutes at the most, usually. Okay? Do you guys have any questions about that? Keep your seatbelt on. The car in the parking. Do what, ma'am? Do they have to park the car? Put it, on. Put it in park. I would put it in park just because it's safer. And once they see that you've put it in park, they know that, that vehicle is not going to move anywhere. Because your real lights, if you've ever noticed, the reverse lights flash on real quick yeah. when it goes into park. That's an indicator to the officer that that car is now immobile and safe. Okay? Can I go outside? You can. You can do that, but just think about where you're at. So if we're on, is anybody familiar with Woody Hayes Drive and there's a berm down the center, like a median, and then there's a sidewalk on the other side? Going over to the right is safer for both vehicles because the officer can get up on the sidewalk. And if you have to exit the vehicle for any reason, the sidewalk's available right there. Where the median, you're standing up on kind of a little hill and you're in the middle of the traffic way. Does that make sense? So it really just, it does depend on the area you're in, the surface you're on. So just use some common sense and saying, if I wanted to be safe, if I had to exit my vehicle, which is the best place to be? Typically, it's to the right. Okay. Good. I forget my license at home, and the police officer is helping me to say what will happen. Okay, so if you forget your license, it's not the end of the world. It's better to have it on you, okay? But there's a system that we can look people up in, and if we know your name and your date of birth, 99% of the time we can confirm it. Plus, we can go with your registration. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have it with you, it's, I've been pulled over without my license before. Um, I'm kind of nerdy and I memorize my license number because <laughs> I forget my wallet and things all the time. So that might be another option for you. You, you, you know, just make sure you're very clear on the spelling of your name because it's probably a lot different than ours because if they don't get something back, then that's going to trigger warning signals. Oh, I need to go talk to this person some more. And it's just being clear, communicating clearly is all it is. Okay. Is there any citation for not having as long as you're a registered driver, you sh you'll be fine. It's when your license is suspended or something and you don't have that card with you, that's when it becomes an issue. Okay? Good. Uh, if I want to drive to another state, mm -hmm. I don't want to carry the passport. Can I carry something else? So it's kind of, it's really hard to carry the passport everywhere with me. So it's like on vacation, I'll drive to another Florida or something. It's okay. fine to just have your license. Yeah, if you just have your driver's license, guys, or a state identification card of some sort, You're fine. you don't need that passport at all. And then put that thing in a safe somewhere, somewhere yeah. safe. Okay. Once you're in the country, you really shouldn't need it if you have another form of identification yeah. for traveling. Yeah, unless you're doing something official, like you need to go to a consulate or something. You're going to Chicago to do something, you know? Um, there's really no need to, you don't need to have that if you're, if you're crossing state lines.
Just no. terms of pulling over as well, the same applies for fire trucks and ambulances, emergency, all emergency vehicles. Okay, so they're not pulling you over, but you need to get out of the way. Anything okay? with red lights or red and blue lights or blue lights. Any other color, green, and, yellow doesn't right. count. And there is a citation for not getting out of the way. Yes. Okay, so Governor that Kansas ambulance Kansas. comes and you're in the way. They may radio an officer. There could be an officer on the way as well because there's a serious emergency. And, and in Ohio, it's actually a jailable offense. Okay? Sir. If I remove from this, country, from this state to another state, uh, should I change the title and the uh, like yes. Yeah, you'll have to re-register your vehicle, mm -hmm. and you'll have to get a new driver's license within that state. Uh -huh. Okay, so Ohio, st Ohio registration and license are only good for the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes. Oh, another question. Go yeah. ahead. Well, just give it a hit. If I don't on the, on the road, and uh, hear some sound like the police uh, senior, and the, the green traffic uh, allowed me to I should stop or? Depends on the direction of travel of the emergency vehicle. So the first thing you all need to do when you hear sirens is identify what's coming and from what direction. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sitting in a four-way intersection at a light and I hear sirens, the first thing you should do is look around and see what direction this, this is coming from. Is it coming from behind you, looking in your rear view mirror, your right, your left, or in front of you? That's going to dictate what you do. If it's coming from behind you, most of the time, depending on the roadway, you might just stay where you're at because you can't move, okay? If it's coming from the left or the right, you're going to avoid that intersection and give them right away so they can safely get through that intersection. Regardless if you have a green light <coughs> or a red light, you need to stay put until it's clear. If they're coming towards you, stay put because you don't know if they're going to turn left or right or continue forward. So just identify the direction they're coming from and then just make that decision whether you're going to stay right where you're at or not and if you're in a place where okay I'm gonna be blocking them then you'll figure out which way you need to go from there to get out of their way but you just have to make sure you see where it's coming you don't want to drive out into the intersection because you could be plowed by a, a fire truck and that's not very good they're usually win because they're a little bigger <laughs> <I am. laughs> okay, if, uh, if I'm on traffic and it's red and I'm on the left side and there is a fire truck or something behind me I can't go in the front or I can't Right, so you may just stay where you're at, and then the other vehicles to your right move out of the way enough to let them through. Once they get close enough and they start air horning, you'll, you're going to make eye contact with the other drivers, and honestly, just without even speaking, you're all going to come up with a plan and everybody's just going to get out of the way. But you've got to make eye contact with people, and you've got to um, you know, let people know, okay, I'm paying attention, I'm just trying to figure out what to do here. And that's the safest way to do that. And we've all been in that position where you're kind of like, uh, where do I go? I'm stuck yeah. here. And then everybody just kind of goes with the flow and gets out of the way. Okay? And oh, once that vehicle has passed you, what I always do is make sure there's nobody else coming behind them or from another direction because there could be another fire truck or now an ambulance or a police officer. So you definitely don't want to be pulling back out into the lane of travel if there's somebody else coming. Okay? Yeah, I just know if there's a fire truck or a medic, there's usually another one of those mm -hmm. and sometimes a police officer with them. Also know that there are vehicles that go out that are SUVs that are the battalion chiefs and they're not a fire truck, they're not an ambulance. They're getting to the scene first to, to see what's going on and then there's going to be two more vehicles. So I mean you could have anywhere from one vehicle to 12 going to one scene. So you just got to be very cognizant of what else you're hearing and seeing, okay? Okay, so um, we're just gonna, we'll just talk about public safety. Are you guys, you guys are on campus for your classes, right? Okay, so you, well, we can talk about on and off campus. It's, it's pretty applicable to both. Um, okay, I'll let you talk about it, Cassie, since okay, well, you are. Okay, well, one of the things that we're really trying to make sure you guys understand, especially for staying, for walking, is minimize what you're carrying. So, I, I don't know if that's, you know, if you have big purses and things like that. I know you guys want to carry you know, your passports and your checkbooks and all your credit cards and your kittens and you want to bring your okay. clothes just in case and then maybe some dinner plates just in case where you go out of them, right? So we, we want to minimize what we're carrying. And by, by minimizing, what I'm saying is, guys, look at your wallets, look at your purses and say, do I need this to function today? I need my identification, some sort of money, and that's about it. So you don't really need as much with you. By minimizing what you carry, 
that's going to minimize your risk a little bit of, okay, if something does happen, I've only got to cancel my bank card and get a new license. I don't have to cancel my bank card and then get a new checkbook and get a new passport and things like that. Okay, so think about what you actually need to function each day. The other thing is everybody here is going to have computers, everybody's going to have phones, everybody's going to have you name it. I want you to take all the serial numbers for your bicycles, your phones, anything worth money, and I want you to write those serial numbers down and those model numbers on a piece of paper and put them away. In the event that those things are stolen, you make a police report for this theft, okay? We can enter that into our system and then hopefully get your property or identify a suspect through that information. And I'll, uh, simply, we just need those numbers. Those will also help you if you make an insurance claim or things like that, okay? When you're walking, um, they always say walk in a group, walk in a group. At about 2 o'clock in the morning when you leave the main library, let me know what group you can find, right? <laughs> so there's other services available, okay? There's the student safety service that you can get escorts. That means walking, biking, or in a vehicle. You can set up appointments with them to do so. Um, if you see other groups walking, it's okay to walk sort of close enough so that they can hear what's going on. You don't necessarily need to engage with them, right? Because you might be the weird guy, creepy guy like him, <laughs> right? But if they're close enough, and if she hears me yell behind her, what's, what's going to happen? I'm gonna turn. She's going to turn around. Yeah. 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 Right? Wouldn't you? Yeah. You heard somebody go, ah, right? So think about outside the box about safety. Know what's open all the time. UDFs are open. McDonald's is open. You know, Buckeye Donuts, sort of my favorite place. Okay? <laughs> Open. So think about those things along your path. And also I want you guys to think outside the box when something does happen. We, we get hung up on the, okay, I'm gonna, I don't see any lights on there, I don't see any lights on there, but, you know, there's light on at that house, I knock on the door and they didn't have help. If there's imminent danger, throw a chair through the window. Because at least that's going to get the suspect to go away, because he doesn't want attention. And you're going to get somebody's attention. We'll deal with the window later. Okay, so think outside the box when it comes to getting help. Okay, when we're walking, we want to put these away. I know the thing that makes us feel the most safe is being on the phone and walking because somebody actually cares on the other end of this line. The problem with that is they don't know right where you're at. So the best course of action is to call somebody. Hey, Ellie, I'm leaving the library right now. Um, I should be home in about 15 minutes at 14th and Indianola. I'm going to go through the Oval and up 14th. And then hang this up and put it away. <coughs> now, if Allie doesn't hear from me in 15 or 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it might be, and she says, I'm going to call the police, she has better information than if something happened to me while we're walking and talking. Because all she's going to hear is, eh, <laughs> and then empty line, right? Yeah. Or the other way, she knows where I was, which way I was traveling, where I should have ended up. So that gives me a really good path to start uh, investigating on, okay? And same thing goes for headphones um, yeah. at night. You know, I think during the day there's enough people usually milling around, especially on campus, but at night I would, you know, discourage you from walking with headphones in, you know. Um, I was just talking to Molly, I went for a run this morning and it was dark out and I'm, I'm getting nervous about it. I just, I've been doing this job for too long. And so she was like, just don't wear your headphones. And I didn't, and I had my pepper spray in my hand, and I was like ready to go, because I just get nervous. You mm -hmm. need to be aware of what's going on. If I had music in, even if it was really, really low, you cannot hear well, what's and, happening. And your brain doesn't divide task that well. So when we're on the phone and we're walking, what happens to your eyes? You watch your feet, because none of us want to be the person that trips or runs into the light bulb, which is one of my favorite things to watch. But. So when we're dividing our tasks like that, our brain can't pick up on signals, survival signals, nor can we hear very well because it's focusing on the voice on the other end or the headphones. And then we can't see because everything is focused. So when we put things away, we walk with our heads up, we have a much better take of our environment. We can identify things a lot easier and avoid them. Right, so the homeless guys on High Street, how many of you guys have been walking and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna cross the street. And I'm gonna go this way because it's just easier. And that's okay. Um, we wanna to touch on securing, via, um, securing your valuables, especially in your cars, because this is a huge red flag. Okay, if you have a car, we want you to be putting your valuables away. And I think 
what we talked about before was you guys have backpacks, purses, phones, chargers, GPS iPods, GPS, the clip for the GPS, put it away. Everything goes to the trunk or where you cannot see it. Mm -hmm. Change, loose change, the worst thing you can leave visible in your car. Okay. Unfortunately, we have people that come to this uh, campus solely to break into cars because it's easy. If you put everything away, you're much less target. And it's just, again, it's minimizing risk. So any book bag, even if you're running into the UDF for five seconds, yeah. do not leave things on your seats. Anything that's visible is a target. My car has been broken into three times, okay? I should know better. Um, the one time I was at a holiday party with all attorneys and I didn't have anything out except for the mount for the Garmin. The Garmin was not out, but it's a crime of convenience. They don't know who I am. They saw the clip and they said, I bet you there's a Garmin in there. Guess what? They got it. You know what was more annoying than not having my Garmin was having to repair a window in the middle of January and having to drive home that night with no window. Okay. And the glasses everywhere. And the glasses everywhere. And cops don't have shop vacs in their cruise. It's yeah. awful. Right? <laughs> we get a lot of people like, Another time, I ran, like, I ran into a CVS for five minutes on, at 11 a.m. on a Sunday in a nice suburb of Columbus, and I left a small gym bag in the front passenger seat. Gone. Okay? So these things happen, and there's very little the police can do because there's no witness. These are smash and grab, literally. They see, okay, I see something in that car, I'm going to take it and go, and no one sees anything. So, yeah, and I can tell you um, the other thing about securing your vehicle or your valuables when you're going to the gym and things like that, minimize what you're carrying because there's ways to shim locks and things mm -hmm. and break into these lockers. Do not, for any, or any circumstance, just stick something in the locker yes. expecting it to be there when you're done working out. It won't be there. Short of a jacket and with nothing in it, your stuff will be gone because there are people that look daily for unlocked lockers with valuables in them. Library. Too. Library. I wish I could say you could go study at the library and leave all your stuff right where it's at and go to the bathroom and come back and it'll be there. It will not. And do not ask another person to watch your stuff that you don't know because we have people that fit the environment that are here stealing things and you might ask that particular person, well, you might watch it myself and he's like, I will watch it walk out with me, absolutely. <laughs> right? So we have these things happen. Because these are public libraries, we cannot control who comes into them. All right? So you gotta be aware that these are public libraries, so anybody can use them. All right? Unless they've been criminally trespassed before because of other criminal activity. Until we catch them and we can do that, they're there. So just think everybody's a suspect, sort of like a paranoid cop like myself. Everybody's <laughs> going to steal my stuff. So even if it's an inconvenience, take the stuff with you to the restroom. If, you're, if you see a crime occur, and, or you know, if you're in a crime, you're involved in it, you're the victim, you want to make a report, you want to call the police. Does everybody know how to call the police? 911. Now, know if you're using your cell phone, it might be slightly different on campus because you might get bumped from one dispatcher to another because the way cell towers work, it just depends on where it goes. So be patient, okay? If you're on campus and you can get to a hard line or a blue phone, those go right to our dispatcher. All right, so even if you say, man, my cell phone got stolen at the library, you can call that number or go to the security guard and they'll call for you and we'll come to you and take a theft report, okay? You see a crime in progress, something like that, 911 is the way to go, or the blue phone, okay? The blue phones go right to us. Short of ordering a pizza, everything is pretty good. You can use those blue phones for anything, all right? Don't, you know, ring it up and just say, hey, just wondering who's on the other line. It's <laughs> <laughs> a crime. That's a little bit of a difference, okay? Go ahead. I was wondering, what if, away from terminals and all these cases, I was wondering, what if I got myself locked out of my car? We do, yeah, we have lock up services. Is there a way to handle that problem? Just call the police or the, you guys know our main number is 292-2121? Call that's that number. That's for OSU. That's for OSU police. Now, off campus, I can't tell you if the police will help you unlock the vehicles. 
It depends. Yeah, and the non-emergency number it for depends. is 645 And you probably won't have a lot of success with CPD, but if you're, I mean, I, I live in Grandview and I've had them come out to my place. So some of the smaller municipalities, they'll come out. It just depends on the division. Can you say the OSU please number again? It's 292-2121. And guys, you know, we'll stretch our limits a little bit. If you're just off campus, say 8th or you're on 10th sort of by the Worthington dorms or think, you know, you're, you're not sort of being up on summit. We, we might be able to, depending if our lieutenant at that time when we have an officer available, we'll be able to help you. Plus we have student safety and we have security services. So we'll, you shouldn't go you know, ahead of shut out the window. Huh? You shouldn't go ahead and shut out the window. No, don't no, shut the window. Let us try. If we shatter, it's more fun anyways. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys have, um, do you pay for AAA? the assistance service is something that you might if you own a vehicle you may want to look into because they can help you if your battery dies or if you get locked out um, so that that's who I would call you know, most likely campus, that's great on campus so you can get a jump start or yeah. a lockout through us um, while some people don't like to do it we can help you change tires as well okay can I ask um, something go ahead can I pay forty dollars for that and use the legal services? You, I wish. Um, you have to be enrolled in classes to be eligible for services. So just get enrolled soon, and then you can use us. It's part of just how we monitor who is eligible. It's part of our contract. If it was up to us, we would say yes. But that's why I mean, ask as many questions as you want. Um, once we finish up with the presentation, we'll stick around to answer any more questions while you're here. Um, so we just want to touch on the laws. While you guys are here, the laws are meant to protect you from being victimized, okay? So while you're in the United States, everybody is covered by the laws of the United States. And it is difficult to know them all. I don't think I know them all. But ignorance is not an excuse when you violate a law. So that's why we're here and there's resources available online to learn as much as you possibly can about what the laws of the United States are. And these are some of the laws, a brief description, they, the ones that are meant to protect you. Prohibit theft, trespassing, underage drinking, domestic violence, and assault. Okay, so police officers in Ohio are not concerned with what was okay in a different country. Okay, and we know that that's a big cultural gap for a lot of people. It's hard to adjust when you get here to a whole new set of laws. You're acclimating to a new environment, trying to make new friends. You're really far away from your family. We get it. But we also want you to know that you're protected by those laws, which is a good thing. Okay, so they protect you from being victimized. So if you are assaulted or a, a victim of a theft, okay, that's a crime, and hopefully we have enough information to have that person arrested. And these laws do incorporate two very important um, crimes that we are very passionate about preventing, our domestic violence and assault. Okay, so we're going to touch on those briefly, and I'm going to let Officer Schaefer Just talk about one it. One quick thing. With this underage drinking thing here, guys, I want to make sure you all understand that, it, yeah, does it apply to somebody under 21? It does. However, if you're the victim of a crime, and you've been drinking, and you're underage, yeah. I can give a rat's hind end if you were drinking. I don't want that to, to keep you from calling the police when you've been the victim of another crime. Okay, that's, that's the last of our concerns. You guys understand that? I'm not advocating that you drink underage, but I'm telling you that if you partake in that behavior and then something else happens to you in the meantime, call us. That's the least of our concerns at that point, okay? So we just want to talk about online accounts because um, in this day and age, everybody has them. We have several of them, and not everybody monitors them that carefully. Okay, so I want you guys, when you leave here, to go to your online accounts and check your privacy settings. Okay, there's no reason that all your stuff should be public. Okay, I, it's just not smart. It's not safe. Okay, you can be friends with, accept friend requests from people that you know and you want to be friends with. But if I get, I've gotten friend requests from people, I'm like, I don't know who you are, and I do not accept it. Okay, because then they can see all your business. Okay, if you're going away for the weekend and your account is public. Hey, I'm checking in at Columbus Airport, flying to, you know, Puerto Rico. Come and, come and rob me. Come to my house and steal all of my stuff because I'm going to be gone for an entire week. Seriously. Okay, if it's private and you trust your friends and they're not going to steal from you, then it's okay. But we really want you guys to take note of what you're posting online. Okay, pictures. 
we want you to be very judicious with the pictures that you're posting, okay? We're all gonna have to get employment. We don't want employers seeing certain kinds of pictures online, okay? So just think about, I don't know if the test should be what would I want my parents to see, but maybe what would I want my future employer to see? What do we do when we get a, an application? I, for employment in our office, I look you up on Facebook. I want to know what you're posting. Any background checks we do? Yep. We go through your social media. Okay. If you are a victim of a crime, if someone's harassing you, bothering you, block them. Block them from your phone. There are affirmative steps that you can take to prevent somebody from bothering you. And if it, that's not working, then you can get law enforcement involved. Okay. So we do want to talk about this issue. It is a very sensitive issue, but it's something that we are all very passionate about preventing. April is actually Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So we are, these are what these pins are for that in our office we're all wearing. They're the No More campaign. So we are, very, all three of us in all, both of our offices are very passionate about preventing sexual assault, okay? So I'm gonna let Officer Schaefer talk about what it is because she's very good at really explaining it in plain terms. <coughs> so the laws in Ohio are sexual assault or rape or any insertion of any object, however slight. All right. Now, I realize that there's some cultural differences, so I want to make sure that this is really, really hit home. You have no right to have sex with somebody without their consent in America, as anywhere in America whether they're drunk, whether they're your wife, whether they're your girlfriend. If they say no, it stops there. If they, if they say no and they want to stop in the middle of intercourse, you stop. That is how it works here. Now, that being said, there's other crimes that are sexually um, motivated. There's things, you have rape, you have sexual battery, there's gross sexual imposition, there's a lot of different things. So really, the nuts and bolts of it is unwanted sexual advances are no good here. You can't do that. Okay, we just recently had a guy riding the bus exposing himself. He's going to jail because you have to keep it in your pants. That's how it works here. Okay? So, again, I want to make sure we understand too it doesn't matter who you are and what the relationship you have with that person, no is no. Okay, and if we get a report, it will be investigated thoroughly. Any reports of sexual assault between student, student, faculty, student, staff, student, other, and student, they all go to student conduct, and then there's another track. Okay, so you could be <coughs> dismissed from school. All right. And it yeah. is a sorry. You know, you've already said this, but it is a crime, and we've seen it happen to rape your wife or your husband. Okay. So again, the relationship has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. And we've seen it with domestic and international students, okay? And most sexual assaults that I encounter, and I'm sure you see the same way, happen between people that know each other. I have had one case in the time I have worked at Student Legal Services where an individual was raped by somebody that she did not know. And unfortunately, our international students are really good targets, okay, for predators. Nine out of 10 victims know their attacker, and ladies, one out of four women here at the Buckeye Nation will be sexually assaulted or perked upon in their time here. So those are big numbers. We have 25% of our population is assaulted or victimized, but yet under 5% of the population is committing the crimes. And guys, you're not out of the woods because one out of 33 men will be sexually assaulted because a predator is a predator is a predator. It's about dominance and ownership of something. So sexual assault uh, violates both sexes. It's, it's something that's awful and terrible. I equate it with murder because it does take your life away from you. It changes everything for a person who's been sexually assaulted. And it's even worse when you know somebody, like your husband or your boyfriend, and that's the person that violates you, or a person that has a different concept of what your relationship is. I tutor you. We're not getting married. Yes, we are. No, we're not. Right? So be, know that it is a crime. Know that only 50% of sexual assaults are reported. And if it's over, was it 200? So 2 million of them are reported a year. Really, the number's like 4 million that occur. All right? Who to call? 
ladies, I can under and guys, I know that there's a masculinity thing attached to it, right? Some machismo. You gotta call somebody and get help. Okay, because of the mental drainage, the physical damage. I understand why people don't directly want to call the police. While I advocate you do, obviously, because I'm a detective, one of the things I like doing is putting bad guys behind bars. Okay? But I understand why not. But there's other places to call, there's other resources you can go to. You can go to Alley, you can go to the guys, everybody at Student Legal, you can go to Student Advocacy, the Sexual Violence Wellness Center, Bravo Off Campus. I mean, there's so many, Sarnco. It's just knowing what they are and then let them help guide you. Ladies and males, you can do a sexual assault examination at the hospital at no cost to you, because that's part of our constitution here in Ohio, all right? But you don't have to make a police report. You can just go in as anonymous. And then that way later, if you decide, you know what, and next day or four years or eight years from now, that evidence is preserved. And when you decide you have the strength to do it, they can pull that kit back out and we can begin the investigation. Okay, so you have options. Limitation is 20 years, right? Is it 20 years? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can't do it right then. Mm -hmm. But let them get you to the hospital and get checked out because you will get care for things like disease and things like that. They'll get you on like super antibiotics and make sure that you're healthy. And then help you with the mental processes that go with that. And then down the road, if they, you decide, hey, I, I need to make a police report because I don't want there to be other victims or that same person just showed up in my class or whatever it might be, we'll go from there. Okay? Any other questions? Go ahead. What if it happens if they don't report it? Later on, they feel like they can. Yeah, that's okay too. Not to the hospital. That's okay too. Just understand that 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 evidence, it, and within 72 to 96 hours, that's your window of collecting DNA okay. and, and other biological evidence. So at that point, you, you can't really get the evidence you're looking for. All right. However, my suggestion is you don't shower. You go to the hospital. You talk with the SANE nurses, and I'm going to tell you what, those SANE nurses guys are amazing, amazing people. They are very good at what they do, and they also are just, there's something about the way they listen. They're very compassionate, and they're very good at what they do. You know, they're, they're writing down details, but they, they have so much knowledge. They can collect that evidence, and then, again, we can go through the packaging and it being anonymous, but once you go past that window, you can still report it, it can still be investigated, it just, um, it's just one of those things that it would be nice to have if we could have it. Also keep it as a secret. Yeah, we can keep it anonymous until somebody's ready. But I'll tell you that um, when they decided to start invest or start testing all kits, they did. They realized, wow, look at all these links with all these anonymous cases with this one woman here. So there's a reason for why we're doing what we're doing. And just so you guys know, we do understand that. And I've, I've experienced this with many clients. Sometimes you just can't tell your family back home. Okay? We, we know. Okay? I've, I've heard that from so many students. I just I can't tell my parents that this happened. I can't tell my parents because this is my boyfriend, and our families have already met, and we're supposed to be getting married, and this will kill them. They, this, you just don't talk about these things. If you come to us, I'm never going to talk to your family. Okay, and if you talk to other people, they're not going to tell your family, but there are resources available for you here for people that you can talk to. And I know it's not your family, but maybe you've got friends that you can talk to, and even if you don't, there are other resources available. We've touched on this, um, domestic violence, okay. It's basically assault between two individuals who live together as household members or have a child together, okay. It is not accepted in the United States, period. Okay, so whatever has happened in the past, we can't enforce from out of the United States. But once you're here, you cannot hit your spouse, you cannot kick your spouse, you cannot you punch your girlfriend. Can't, you can't even do this. Yep. Let's go. You can't do any of that. You can't restrain them, prevent them from leaving. Sorry, okay. I, I used to oh, demonstrate <laughs> Also, it can be verbal and psychological. I've seen a lot of students who are abused psychologically because they have control over you. Okay? Now that you're here, we don't have to accept that, and we shouldn't. And guys, when you need to take a breath, if you feel like in that second that you're going to, I'm going to grab a hold of her and make her listen, walk outside and take a breath. 
just walk outside and separate. And I know that it, it goes against every grain of everything that you maybe have been raised with. But just go outside, just walk around a little bit, do something else other than stand there and argue with each other. And okay. just remember also, you guys, I mean, we have situations where, you know, the neighbors are the ones who call the police. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you think you're in the privacy of your own home doesn't mean that somebody doesn't hear what's going on. And if somebody's next door and they hear a skirmish, they might call the police. So think about that. Because then the police show up on your door and your girlfriend's got a black eye. That's going to be a world of hurt for you. And ladies, you can't hit your guys. <laughs> I've arrested many a women where the guy's like, I was trying to get away from her. She just kept coming at me and I pushed her and then she called you guys. And we get there, he's got scratch marks all over his face and everything. So don't set him up for failure. You're going to go to jail too. It goes both ways. Okay. And a lot of the same services that are available for victims of sexual assault are also in a different way available for victims of domestic violence. The city of Columbus has a great program down at the courthouse if you are a victim of domestic violence. There are advocates that will sit with you in court, will tell you you don't have to come to court if it's too difficult. You can go sit on this different floor in my office while this happens. So there are a lot of resources. Of course, we want you to call the police. We want you to make reports because if it happens once, I don't know what the percentages are, but it's probably going to happen again. And you okay. might need the documentation. Quite honestly. Okay, we made it. So we'll stick around. If you guys have questions, uh, let us know. Come on up. And thanks for thanks for coming in. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.